All right, perfect. Um, so we will be starting in Judges 6, but why don't we open up with a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for bringing us here safely, and I just pray that you'd be with us during this time of study so that we can gain some interesting insights and just get to know you and your word better through this time. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, this chapter 6, we're starting the story of Gideon. So this is the first person that we're covering where it actually takes more than one lesson to get through his whole life. It's a longer story, and we're covering chapters, Judges chapters 6 and 7, and it sort of sets itself up like a, like a three-act structure, even though it's only about half of his life, and we'll get to the rest of it next week. Uh, but this is the first really long story we get, and it's more complex. Like, a few weeks back we had, when we started with the Judges, you know, we had the super simple formula of Israel does something bad, they get oppressed, they cry out to God, God delivers them, repeat the cycle. It's still the same cycle, but our stories are getting longer and more intricate and complex, and so are the people involved. So Gideon is quite a character. So we'll just ask a few things first. Um, how would you define fight or flight? What is that, if someone didn't know that term? Reaction to panic. Okay, reaction to panic. So when... Or confrontation. Confrontation. Okay, so explain what's happening with the two choices. You either stay and fight or you run. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. Do you have some... I thought you had something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean... It doesn't actually necessarily mean fight or flight all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was picking up on what Kim said. Um, like in a shooting situation, somebody pulls out a gun and you have a gun concealed, say. Okay. Well, you know how you don't really know if you're going to use that gun? You've heard of this. Like, you've got, you know, to you, I'm sure I've heard of this. Where my, I want to carry and I want to, you know, just in case one of those incidents happen. Sure. And then you panic. So you didn't fight or flight. Oh, I see. You panic with the same phrase as you use that Okay. Yeah, so fight or flight tends to be, like, it's a biological mechanism when you sense danger. And the things that are like stimulated in you can either help you fight harder or run away faster. And one of the problems we have in the modern age is that, you know, back in the day when it was like, oh no, I'm in the woods, there's a wolf, problem. Fight or flight triggers. Now it's like, oh no, deadline at work, problem. And uh, like that, panic, like you said, is this, it's the same reaction that would be really helpful out in the wild or on the battlefield or doing almost anything else. And then it just kind of stresses our system irregularly. Uh, but the lesson tonight, this, the story of Gideon has a lot to do with fear. Fear is going to come up a lot or some variation of fear in a few different contexts. So that's what we're going to be looking at. But I do want to use some of the questions, two of the, the opening questions under getting started in your book on page 53. I'm just going to read this because I think this is funny. So apparently, sometimes people act as if they're listening to a person when they're really not. And as a teacher, I've never seen this. I've never witnessed this. For example, a husband will claim his wife never told him they had company coming over, even though he told her it was fine two days earlier. The husband is convinced the wife is crazy, while the wife knows her husband is crazy. Question one, have you ever had selective hearing? What were the circumstances? I yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to get a lot of that. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk about honesty next. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
Some people just want to hear what they want to hear. Mm. That's true. But now that that's every day, not just with your wife, but with your husband, somebody just wants to just, their mind sells so they hear what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. You say one way, some people say one way, you're taking it. The way you're taking it is the way you are, you know you're going to take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay. And the next advanced step that he's talking about is when we're talking mm -hmm. and we're both interested in the subject, but I might be not really quite listening because I'm thinking about what I'm going to say back. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're doing the same thing. Yeah. So you get that too. Yeah. Talk past each other a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Any particular situations you find uh, when you maybe tend not to hear things that you're told later you should have heard? Watching TV. Watching TV. <laughs> Your language centers are otherwise engaged. Yeah. I come home and I have a second shift and we're all ready to sit down. Star Trek is starting to run off and on. And she just lay on the couch. And then all of a sudden it's like the data box sets up. She starts talking. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on before we start getting more people in trouble. Um, yeah, the point is that the character that we're looking at today, the man Gideon, uh, he seems to have a hearing problem as well. Uh, a listening problem, and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more. There's something specific about hearing and listening in the Bible that's pretty interesting. So, I already said we're going to be talking a lot about fear tonight. All right, so I'm just going to start. I'm going to jump in at Judges chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll start talking a little bit. Chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made themselves dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown, we're talking about agriculture here, when they had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass, for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers or locusts for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord." So this is a little more in-depth than the normal, they were mightily oppressed by whoever. So quick recap, what's happening here specifically? What are the people doing to them? They're destroying their food. Yeah, so it's, it's a little different than like, we own you, pay us tribute money. They're specifically going in, they're destroying and probably stealing crops as well. It says that the Israelites are making these like cave outcroppings where they can hide, hopefully, enough food just to survive. So a big part of their country is really in a, a unique situation. Um, so that's the setup. That's the initial problem. And in verse 8, so because of this, uh, the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amalekites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So this unnamed prophet just sort of is sent to someone. I, I don't know who he's actually proclaiming this to, but it's getting somehow proclaimed to the people of Israel. This is the message for them. In that last verse, verse 10, God told them not to fear the gods of the Amorites. 
How would you explain the word fear in this verse in relation to the, the gods of the Amalekites? The same biblical way you talk about fear with God, like the respect and the awe. And... Yeah, yeah. So it's the same way in Hebrew that it is in English. I can be like, we talked about spiders last week. I can fear spiders, and that's one thing. And then I am told throughout the Bible to fear the Lord. And that's different. It, it, it's a different thing. Not that, let's use a bigger example, like the wolf that we were talking about earlier. Now, I can fear that because it's dangerous. And you can have that same fear for God that happens a lot. Like when the prophets have visions of God, they're terrified. And we're going to get to that with Gideon. But it's the idea of giving them a certain amount of weight or respect. And they seem to have a fear for the Amalekite, the gods of the Amalekites. And we'll get into that also in a second. But yeah, just know that in Hebrew, we're dealing with the same fear. So as I said, fear is going to come up a lot. It's going to come up in all these different forms. So the message from the prophet is, hey, you were told not to fear these gods. God's done great things for you in the past, but you haven't listened to him. Okay, verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak which was in Ophrah that, that pertained to Joash, the Abbey is a right. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. We'll keep going in a sec, but what is a, do you know what a wine press is? Like, do you know what it looks like, more importantly? Does anyone happen to know that? Like an ancient wine press, because you guys look this up all the time? <laughs> okay, so... A wine press would typically be in a mountainous or cave region, or it could be a stone structure that's set up where you have stone walls, and then you have like a stone hollowed out pit. Think like a, like a small in-ground swimming pool, basically. They would put all the grapes in there. There was a small little like canal that the juice could flow out of. They would crush the grapes. But the point was, it's basically in, more or less enclosed, it's covered up. Whereas Gideon's not dealing with grapes. It says that he's uh, threshing wheat. Now, I think we talked maybe early in the series about threshing floors, that there's a place, okay, you have your grain, you have the crop, and you go to a threshing floor. Normally, that's out way out in like the middle of a plain because they like it to be windy because you have a big stone thing you crush the wheat a little bit and then when you shake it loose the chaff the stuff you don't want gets blown away and you have the grain so because of what's going on he is threshing wheat in this hidden enclosed covered up wine press area like it's not really good for the job and it makes the point that he's He's doing this because he's hiding from the enemy. Okay, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And if you don't think God has a sense of humor, I think that's pretty funny. Okay, so this guy, he's just like hiding just to do his grain. And uh, God, you know, this angel comes and says, you know, hey, God's with you, you great big warrior. You know, that's kind of funny. I think it's like, it sort of speaks to what God's going to do through him, but it also kind of feels like a shot at him a little bit. You know, I, I don't know. I, I took it that way. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean in? Oh, that, um, that's a good... I don't know. So... Um, that's a good point. Either way, he's not visible. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you could do either. Um, if we had. Probably wouldn't be inside though if, if it was the way you described the uh, the threshing, because it, it, the stuff that is spilled would go into the 
the grapes. Oh, well, either way, it's not the place he's supposed to be doing it. Like, it's not a good oh, place to fresh wheat. Um, just trying to picture oh, yeah, no, I'm not entirely sure. So, if you can actually picture it like, okay, imagine you're, like, in-ground swimming pool, and then you still have the area outside the swimming pool where you're not supposed to run, and then it's walled off. So, he could be, it does say by, you're right, so it, I mean, he, so he might not be in the wine press itself, he may be on top, on the top area, still surrounded by walls. He could just be behind it. Um, either way, he's hiding, but yeah, you're right, it is, uh, yeah, there is a linguistic thing. Word, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I think we have the angel of the Lord sort of making fun of Gideon a little bit. Uh, who has Judges 6.13? Could you read that, please? And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befall us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Thank you. Okay, so... The angel of the Lord said, hey, God's with you. What is Gideon's argument to the contrary? We're here. Midianites are, you know, destroying our food, we're hiding. Mm -hmm. How is that working? Yeah. Have you ever, like, maybe... It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, have you maybe heard some people, like, in modern day, say, like, hey, this bad thing happened, where's God? That kind of thing. Yeah, it happens all the time. And it, yeah, did, did you have something? it gets serious. People they, get real offended. God with God with the church. Yeah. People, Christian, just, you know. And it, it's, it's tough if they're really stuck in that mindset. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need prayer, you gotta be patient. Yeah. I am kind of surprised, I guess, but it looks like our fathers told us of this, like of all miracles, which comes yeah. back to there was. Education. Yeah. Education. Yeah, Gideon knew what it could look like. What's up? Well, I find it partly stupid. <laughs> because, well, to follow her frame, yeah. he should know why they're there. Mm -hmm. Because once again, the Israelites screwed up. <laughs> and they're there. Yeah. And, and if you look at verse 12, when he says, when the angel says, the Lord is with thee, well, you know, it's got to start sometime. And mm -hmm. he could be saying it right now is where I started. Mm -hmm. Look, the Lord is with thee. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is, is it, you know, so I don't know. I think it's a combination of both of those things. There's a lot going on, I, I think, with Gideon. Because, so one, it's the, well, it doesn't look like God's with us. Okay, like, and you see that all the time. And it's also interesting that in verse 13, he says like, hey, you know what? Where's the stuff our fathers told us about? Where's God delivering us from Egypt? So Gideon, this man back in Judges 6, is saying, things aren't happening like they were back in the Bible times. You know, like, it's that argument that like, sometimes we make today. Did you hear that before, right? Yeah, yeah. But also, too, like Gideon may not have done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, because obviously he, he knows about it. Yeah. Um, so he may be looking at it saying, well, yes, maybe Israel has sinned, but it's collective. So they all share in the burden of it, unfortunately. Yeah. So even if, they, if he did everything right, Israel as a collective group did not. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why it's hard for him to understand that. Yeah. No, there, there's a lot going on. Yeah. That's why it's so important about you know, what you do, what you say, you think, what you say, Yeah, we hate living other people's consequences if it's bad. Mm -hmm. If it's good, we're okay. You know? We're yeah. good bad. You know? right. If it's not good, you know, get a lot of, a lot of reason. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this sort of um, bolsters up some of the themes we've been talking about with like, God being in control of even like nations rising and falling and different things happening, like ordinary type events. And even someone in the Bible is looking for like 
well, when's God just going to, you know, part the Red Sea again? When's he going to do some miraculous supernatural thing? Not realizing like, hey, a lot of times God, he mostly works through people. That's sort of the deal the whole time. That's kind of the point. But yeah, we, we have a lot to get to. So I'm going to, I'll recap the last few verses. And I want, I, I want to read verses 11 through 23. I'm going to take a slightly different tact than the book. But I want to read this interaction between him and this person and ask a few questions. Okay, so I'll go through these first few quickly because we read them. Uh, verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord, sat under the oak which is in Aphra, that pertains to Joash the Ab- Abzerite, and his son Gideon. Verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, oh, Bible times. Verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. The Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You'll kill them like it's only one person. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not thence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Gideon went in, made ready a kid, a young goat, and unleavened cakes, of an epoph of flour, and the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out to him under the oak, and presented it. The angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up a fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Okay. That's, it's quite, it's a, it's an interesting interaction that happens here over the course of these verses. So first thing I want to ask is, does this interaction remind you of any other interactions that we've seen throughout the Bible or that you know of? It constantly asks for signs. Okay. That, that whatever is being said is true. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any, uh, in, any, any, like, in particular interactions that this reminds you of in different parts? What do you guys? Does this scene remind you of anything else in the Bible? Other than what you just said in general? Yeah. Like, why? How so? Well, he kept saying, you know, hey, could you hold off? Like, what if I find... This and that for people, but you're mm-hmm. not sure to see. Kind of like bargaining with God? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and then he says, well, I can't. Find. Well, what about this and that, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the fire, the, the fire with God is, so that was an acceptable sacrifice mm-hmm. and signified who, who he offered the, the meat and the bread to. Yeah. And the same thing with, uh, what is it, Elijah and the prophets of that. Yeah. So the true God burned up the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You know, so so it, it, to, it you know, we got the whole picture, but you know, it's evidence that this person is divine. Yeah. And is accepting that offer. Mm-hmm. So that that would put Gideon in, in let's say in the right place or right relationship with, with his God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought of uh, the burning bush, not because of fire, but because of the excuses. So when God wants to send Moses to deliver the people from Egypt, he makes all these excuses of, oh, well, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I can't do this, I'm not good at speaking. I, and Gideon, his first response is, hey, our family's poor. I'm like the, I don't know what he means by the least in his father's household. I don't know if he's the youngest, the smallest, the, he's the runt of the litter. I don't know exactly. But he, he makes excuses instantly. He says, like, no, I'm, I'm not qualified to do this. 
I also thought of, I thought of the, the fire um, because he brings out bread, meat, and there's broth involved. And it, it, it doesn't say explicitly that he pours the broth on it, but that's kind of the picture that I got because he pours out this broth soup type thing. And yeah, it reminded me of Elijah when he builds a altar, there's the sacrifice on it and he commands them to drench it in water to kind of show that, hey, God's going to light this on fire and it, it's God that's doing it and he's powerful, he can do whatever. And when they, by this point, they've only built the tabernacle, but when they complete the tabernacle back in the wilderness, the like roving tent temple that they had in the desert, their first thing God sends fire down onto the altar and he consumes the sacrifice showing that it's acceptable like pastor was saying so there's a few allusions to different things here showing you that what gideon is doing at the start is acceptable that god's in it um second question that i have for you with this is who is gideon talking to this may seem straightforward or it may not Does it? 11 through 22. Well, yeah. You're saying when Gideon calls him Lord? Like verse 13, Gideon said unto, oh, my Lord, like you could say that to any high, it, it, like it's almost like sir, like a, like a formal title. So verse 14, and the Lord, all caps, we discussed that's the divine name, that's Yahweh, looked upon him and said, go in the, and he, he talks to him there. And verse 15, again, it's that lowercase normal Lord, like sir. Verse 16, and the Lord said unto him, surely I'll be with thee. So what we have in this interact, do you have something? I'm just going to say, the other one is more in praise. Mm. Well, so there's this interesting thing where the angel of the Lord, that's the first thing that's mentioned. And at the same time, the author of Judges has no problem interchanging the divine name of God at any given time, and almost seems to go back and forth. Um, if you look at, okay, verse, the end of verse 21, that's when the sacrifice has been consumed with fire. Then the angel of the Lord departs out of his sight. When Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, Lord God, for I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. It's strange, and this is not the only biblical passage like it. Um, Sunday, in Sunday school, we talked about the story of Jacob wrestling with an angel. It says, at first, it's described as a man. Then it says he's wrestling with an angel. And then at the end of the exchange, he says, I've seen the Lord's face and lived. And even way back, the Jews have a category for, they understand that God is huge, infinite, omnipotent, the whole no one can see the face of God and live. You have that. And you have this interaction where you have a physical person who is enough of the Lord that they feel very comfortable interchanging these things. And it's not a problem in the ancient mindset. Yes? Like, what was I? Just thinking outside the box here for a second. Sure. Is it possible because the angels mentioned so often mm -hmm. that the angel was with them the whole time? Is that possible? No, no, Gideon. I'm not, not sure what you mean. Well, the angel appeared with Gideon. Yeah. 
So maybe he was, and he was talking too. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was talking to the angel the whole time. He wasn't talking to God. Because the angel was with him so much. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, you know, a lot of people say there's an angel over your shoulder. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. No. So all I'm throwing out, and we're not, we're going to leave this. We're going to keep going on with the story. Is that in the Old Testament there is a category for not only the God who is up in heaven, enthroned, infinite, unknowable in a sense, and a physical manifestation that they are very comfortable interchanging with. So, and remember, angel is a Hebrew word that just means messenger. So they are perfectly comfortable interchanging that with this physical representation with the Lord, the divine name, the God who they understand to also be creator of heaven and the whole nine. So even back in the Old Testament, they're very early set up for the idea of, mo- not, not modes, I, don't, I specifically don't use that term, um, persons of God that later gets developed as Jesus Christ, who is God, yet his own person, yet one with God. So very early on, they're setting up these ideas these very complex ideas that in the ancient Near Eastern mind are not as, not that they're not as confusing, but the line between the two is blurred and that's okay with them. Um, Yeah, even this God that they go out of their way to constantly say the Lord our God, he is one, and yet they're fine with two persons there. So that's not in your book. But it, it's such a distinct part of that interaction. I feel like we had to at least take a, a pause there and talk about that. Um, but let's, let's move on. Okay, so this angel of the Lord has tasked him. He's going to be the one to deliver Israel. Okay, so later that night, verse 25. It came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto Gideon, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father has, and cut down the grove that's by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. That's a pretty intense, like, desecration of this altar to Baal, the false Amalekite Canaanite deity. So an altar to Baal that was found in a similar area by archaeologists was like a round altar, like 40 feet across, the big stone. Like, it, it, it's, it's huge. And we talked early in the series about the Asherah poles, the basically big stakes of wood that were for Baal's consort, his like wife deity. So God has him cut down the the wooden pole, use that as the wood for this sacrifice that he is making to God. So you're kind of doing, you're, you're breaking Baal's altar, you're using the wood that they had set up that's like a sacred thing for them, and you're burning a bull to God. So as you can imagine, the people are not thrilled with this. Um, Verse 27, uh, Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Okay, Uh, we're on page 56 if if you're not keeping up with that because we were a little off. Um, page 56, question 8. What did Gideon rebe- reveal about his fear of God by electing to destroy the altar of Baal under the cover of darkness? He's afraid the Lord would protect him. Because if he did it during the day, people would see it. Mm-hmm. I got out of it that he was still unsure of God. Yeah. There's just no faith there, technically. Yeah. At least not autonomy. 
Yeah, he's willing he's to be obedient. Yeah, but under certain circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'll do it. There's not a lot of trust involved. Okay, so understandably, the townspeople want to kill him. Okay, they, he just desecrated the altar to their god. And it turns out that that was his, an altar that his father had set up. Now, uh, we, won't, we won't read this, the passage, but his father actually backs him up because they're like, hey, he destroyed the altar to Baal, let's kill him. And somehow, even though it was his dad's altar, he, he was in charge of setting it up. I don't know if he was a priest to Baal or what. But he says, hey, if like, Baal didn't defend himself, so what kind of god is he? Which is interesting. Um, so then the people end up calling Gideon uh, Jerubal or Jerubal, which means um, let Baal plead. Like, hey, if, if this... God has any juice to him, like, let, let him plead his own cause. You know, we don't have to do anything. So that kind of gets thrown around. All right. Um, we won't look at the book much, but page 57, since we're still moving along. And so Gideon was afraid of the townspeople, and now we're getting to Gideon being afraid of the Midianites. So real quick in verse 33, chapter 6, verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abizer was gathered unto him. So even though he just had this problem, as the Spirit of God comes to him, as the foreign army is amassing, he blows a trumpet, and his town seems to rally around him at this point. They're they seem to have some more respect for him after this interaction, which is interesting. So then you end up with, actually, let's look at the text, uh, 36, verse 36. Now we skipped a couple. So he blows his trumpet, the town comes, and a handful of other tribes of Israel come together because this foreign army is amassing once again. They're probably going to come and raid and take the food and the crops and everything that they have. So Gideon ends up with 32,000 men, which sounds like a lot of men, but they already went out of their way to say, hey, the Midianites, they're teamed up with the Amalekites. The textbook throws out the number of 135,000 Midianites. I don't know if I missed it. I didn't see that in the text. I don't... It sounds like a lot, but they said that they compared them to basically swarming locusts because they're also taking their crops, so that, that's a good metaphor. And they said that the people and their camels, which is also a funny thing to think about, but that's their tank in the day, um, they were like without number. So there's a ton of them. And Gideon has 32,000 men, and this is what God's calling him to do. Okay, verse 36. Gideon said unto God, if thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor. And if dew be upon the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth besides, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. Okay, what's happening here? Yeah, another test. Like... We didn't, believe it or not, there's actually stuff that we didn't talk about with his interaction with the angel. It was, when you reread the passage, it's kind of unclear at first if Gideon has any idea who he's talking to when he first sees the angel under the tree. It kind of looks like he's just talking to a man, and that's why he asks him, like, how do I know, like, like give me a sign of, who, like, Make sure it's God that's sending me, because he's saying, yeah, God's with you, God's going to do that. He doesn't seem to get that, and there's kind of an indication that, you know, maybe Gideon actually didn't know who he was dealing with at first, and when that fire was set and the angel disappears, that that's when he actually realizes, oh, hey, this is, we know who we're dealing with now. But once again, he sets up a test, and... God is very patient with him. Verse 38, And it was so, for when he rose up early the next, uh, on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed out the dew of the fleece, a bowl full of water. 
So this, this happened exactly as he asked for the sign to happen. This fleece is soaked. And verse 39, And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground. So he reversed his test. He said, like, okay, no, you, you, you made the ground dry, you filled the fleece with water. Okay, cool, thanks, but <laughs> one more thing. And, of course, God very patiently does this again. Good idea, bad idea? Like, he's the rational man. <laughs> he's the rational Christian. Isn't he? Yeah, I mean, if, if I told you, hey, like, God's telling me to do this thing, and you'd probably be like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? Well, you know what, though? Like, like, sure, you go for it. <laughs> give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Because it was his father's altar to Baal. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't, it's not like you're taking a kid who was steeped in, he knew some, mm -hmm. but maybe he's never had, because Israel was not with the Lord at the time, that he never had the grounding that others may have. I mean, like we have the benefit of looking at this and saying, oh, well, how stupid. Mm -hmm. But they were living it. Mm -hmm. And to me, I would be saying, well, okay, I understand. And he didn't know enough to say, God, don't be angry with me. <laughs> but could you please do this? Yeah. So okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm feeling some dissenting opinions around the table. <laughs> I'm just trying to look at it both ways. Yeah. I thought maybe he was still trying to get away out of this whole situation. Yeah. Well, but also, too, in, in hereditary, when, when he's saying he's the least of his father's family, if he's the youngest and he is so used to being last in everything, that for him to step forward, it is like way out of his comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know what I mean? Well, and it's sort of God's MO throughout the Bible. Like, so when you think of, okay, before he was king, uh, David, so. Samuel says, oh, God tells Samuel, the prophet, this household from here, there's going to be the king in Israel. And the father parades the strong sons, the oldest son, the, the valiant ones. And he's like, no, nah, this isn't right. And they're like, oh, yeah, that, that kid who watches the sheep. Yeah, that, that's going to be the guy. So there's this, not only is Gideon playing that role of the person who's really not qualified in and of himself, now he's being sent against this huge army with a very insufficient army to do this. So it's going to be God coming through or they're, they're just all going to die. Which does happen sometimes. I mean, that, that's an option. I don't really kind of slack. Yeah. I, I, I think, like I said before, I think he's friends of Barack. I think he, there's two guys are buddies. They're both horses. <laughs> Because they both did the same thing. Yeah. They were both, they both whipped out and they did tough. <laughs> and you know what? On Don's part, with the uh, talking about the, the least, mm -hmm. you know, I think, and it, does, it doesn't really say anything about this, but you, you said that it's interesting that all these Israelites came to his call when he asked for an army. Yeah. I think that speaks more of the Father. I think the Father is special. Mm -hmm. Because if he was the least of his family, well, the father stuck up for the least. Mm -hmm. So, so that's pretty good fathering. Mm -hmm. And then because he did, all these people came. So I think the father was special, but they don't want to talk too much about that. Though. Yeah. But he had an all the bail. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that they he still knew about the past with Egypt. So whatever's going like that kind of shows how Israel went back and forth between just pure like ancient Near Eastern pagan polytheism and proper following the Lord because he had, they had an altar to Baal, it's his dad's, and he also knows about these old stories and doesn't seem to have a mental conflict about that. 
So it's very just, it's pagan, it's we can have multiple gods, we can do this, and that's all cool until the angel of the Lord comes to him. Okay, so, chapter 7. Things are heating up. The fleecing is done. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, uh, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt or boast themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So according to our textbook, they're outnumbered like four to one at least already. And God's like, yeah, it's too many people. Even with this amount, you guys could still try to take the credit for it. So again, he's going in smaller, and it's going to have to be God that does that. Okay, so... Verse 4, the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, we needed to keep going there. Um, Verse 3, now therefore go... Go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand. There remained ten thousand. So yeah, whoever's scared, yeah, go home. No problem. I'm sure Gideon wished he could be one of the twenty-two thousand, but he was not. So all these people go home. Ten thousand men left. Verse 4, the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, um, of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee, and whoever I, okay, so whoever God says is staying is staying, whoever God says is going is going. So he sets up this little test down by the river. And basically they say, okay, guys, take five, go get a drink. Water is actually good back then. (laughs) And the very simple, almost seemingly random test is, all right, so all the guys who, you know, like basically get down, like prone, kind of like drinking directly out of the river, you're going to send them home. Only the people who like kneel down, cup the water, and drink still looking alert. They weren't really in danger yet. Like, there's, they're not in battle, you know, so it's, it's kind of unclear. You could say, like, oh, these are the better, so I don't know. They're, they're a little more alert, maybe. They're a little more thoughtful. But other than that, there's no real explanation given as to why the one and not the other. Okay, so after this, Gideon is left with 300 men. That's what he's got. We went from 10,000 to 300. This will have to be something interesting. Okay, let's look at verse 9. It came to pass the same night, the Lord said unto Gideon, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go with uh, Fura thy servant down to the host. Thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Fura his servant unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Okay, so just to give you a little geography here, Gideon and his 300 men are up on, it's called Mount Gilead. So they're just, they're up on this large hill, small mountain. That's just the topography of Israel. And then the opposing army is down pretty far, but they're in a valley at the base of another mountain. So God says, hey, okay, I've, I've, I'm delivering them to you. I have delivered them to you. You can go down and do this now. But if you're afraid, take your servant and go down into the camp. And what you'll hear there will give you some courage. So naturally Gideon says, oh, no, I'm good. We're just going to send the army. No. So Gideon and his servant are scared and go down into the camp to see what's going to happen, which really, if anything is terrifying, 
Granted, the battle of 300 against a billion is not good odds. Sneaking down into the enemy camp at night, that seems terrifying. Like, that doesn't seem like the easy option there. But that's what he does. Okay, so, verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east uh, lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand of the sea for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream to his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it, and the tent lay along. This fellow answered him and said, There is nothing else. Uh, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Midian and all his host. Okay. So there's been a lot of really clear stuff from God all along the way. Like very clear, hey, can you do this miraculous thing for me? Sure, Gideon, no problem. Whatever you need. And for all this, Gideon is still scared, he's still frightened, he still doesn't want to go to battle. So he stumbles on this tent, and two guards are talking to each other, and one's like, this could be a dream that like, you or I have, that you're telling your friend about the next day. Like, yeah, this giant loaf of bread was rolling down a hill, and it ran into my house and just like, knocked the whole thing over. And your friend naturally looks at you and says, you know what? This is a word from God. What? Like, this is the strangest situation. I can't imagine this under normal circumstances. This is just a very strange thing. If, if anyone said that to you, you would just not believe a word they said. That, that's the strangest interpretation you can possibly take. Um, Gideon did not think so. Okay, verse 15. And it was so, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Okay, uh, page 59 in your book. Sorry. Page 59, question 11. And I'm going to give you a second for this, but what do you think is, uh, look at verse yeah, 15. What do you think is the key word in the verse? It's odd that they ask you for this, but just tell me what you think. Interesting, okay. Worship. Worship, okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, it's like... Any other thoughts from the rest of the crew? Because we haven't heard what the book's looking for yet, and that's the key. No? No, okay, so I'll give it to you, because it's an issue of, well, what do you, like, you know, depending on what question you're trying to talk about, what's the key word? They're saying that the key word is uh, heard or listened, so some form of listened, Gideon heard. Um, And yes, I very much understand why, okay, once he actually gets faith, he worships God, um, the interpretation of the dream is very important. Like, there, there's a lot here that is probably a stronger key word than what the book is looking for. But it, it's interesting that, so throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you don't really have a word for obey. Like, so, especially, like, the story of Abraham So God tells Abraham, okay, leave your parents. You're going to go into this country that you've never been to. And he doesn't really explain why. And he just says, okay, you're going to go that. And Abraham listened to the voice of the Lord. So he goes. So there's this, even um, take Adam and Eve. So you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's this snake hanging out around it. And she sees the fruit. She desires it. And she listens to the voice of the snake, not God. So there's this thing all throughout, especially the Old Testament, that whose voice you listen, like they very much distinguish heard, like, oh yeah, I heard that from, when you listen to the voice of God, it means that you are doing 
the will of God, in a sense. That, that's how the language ends up working. Um, so, finally, after an angel, after God speaking to him, after several miracles, he hears the interpretation of the dream, and that's what sets him off. And it's... Um, you could probably take a lot from that. I don't think... Yeah, we definitely don't have time to talk about that, but... You could take a lot from that, that he, it's this vague kind of weird dream from some random pagan soldier that finally trips, like triggers his faith in God. Between the why? Because they had no reason to talk about Gideon's faith because it wasn't there. So he has to understand this is from God. Mm -hmm. Like God's putting that into the enemy. Oh, sure. I mean, you know what I mean? So oh, yeah, I definitely think it's divine. Sure it's faith. Yeah. 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 But, but it's interesting that he didn't listen to God the whole time. time. And what, what he ended up listening to is this strange prophecy dream. dream. Um, but okay, okay, so we need to get to the battle, the last thing that happens. Okay, so verse 16. Okay, okay, so remember, 300, 300 men. He divided, divided the 300 men into companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers, or torches within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. So three companies, 100 men in each, gives them a... A trumpet, which is probably like a shofar, a ram's horn, which is used for battle or worship, which is interesting. A torch and some sort of like clay pot to cover the torch. And he says, all right, you got all this? Follow my lead. Like he doesn't actually tell them what to do. He goes, hey, I'm going to do something. Just roll with it. Okay, that's his battle plan. Um, look at verse 19. So Gideon... And the, uh, and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers and held the lamps in the left hand and the trumpets in the right hand to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the hosts fled to uh, Beth Shittah and Jerathah and the border of Abomehalah and uh, unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, out of Asher, out of Manasseh, and pursued after Midians. And, the, and Gideon sent messengers through, throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters unto uh, Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the, took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Okay, so are you hopefully getting a visual of what the battle plan was? So remember, they're, the enemy's down in the valley. So you sort of, you got your 300 men up on the embankment, they're sneaking up, their torches are covered by the pots, and they have the trumpets, and it's the middle of the night, all at once, suddenly you have 300 trumpets blowing, like for a battle charge. All these torches out of nowhere suddenly start shining because they break the pictures that are covering them. So you sort of have this effect of, in the middle of the night, what seems like it could be a massive army, is right kind of surrounding you on top of the mountain that you are in the valley of. But they actually didn't have any weapons. No, no. Yeah, they, they, so they don't, they don't even have swords, swords, really. I mean, their, their hands, hands are pretty full. And sort of some of the other 
judges we talked about where the Lord sort of confuses the enemy or uh, KJV says discomfits a lot where they basically utter panic, start turning on each other. A lot of them end up killing each Because you got to remember, they are a few different groups that are camped in this army. You have the Midianites, the Amalekites, and a few others. They kind of start all just like hack slashing, going crazy. They're panicked, they're confused, and they start fleeing. And Gideon calls several other tribes of Israel to help, and they are the same tribes that were in the army before. The same people are mentioned. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting battle. I guess we'll call it a strategy, a battle divine help situation. Um, although it is interesting if you look up in history, cert, like, okay, we all know like the Trojan horse, like this kind of um, underhanded, very sneaky way to get into the city. There are different examples, especially in ancient warfare, of like, these interesting tricks where you make your army look significantly larger than it is. I even was reading about something called the Ghost Army in World War II that was like inflatable tanks that the Allies would set up in certain places to throw Germany off of, like make them think they had more numbers than they did. Um, even having like the same troops change outfits in, and move to different locations so they thought that they had them more surrounded than they did. Um, so yeah, you have this very odd very interesting scenario that God uses to get them exactly what they needed. And verse 25, I, <laughs> I guess that, so Oreb and Zeb, they are the two princes of the Midianites. Uh, they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb. I guess they named it that after they killed him there? Or, they, or he had a rock? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And uh, the other one, is it a wine press? Yeah, the wine press of Zeb. Zeb. So I don't know if these places got named that after they killed them there, or if they specifically, ironically, took them to the places that they owned and killed them there. I, I don't know. Um, and the book does point out on page 60 that uh, Oreb means raven and Zeb means wolf. And the book suggests that these may have been uh, these, yeah, these men may have been given these names to reflect their ravaging ways, which I thought was cool at the very least. I don't know if it's true. It's interesting. Um, so, okay, we need to wrap up. And once again, the make it personal questions, very personal. So if you want to read over those, think about those in your spare time, that'd be great. Um, what unfounded fears control your life and keep you from serving God as you should? What attributes of God demand you fear him above all else? Um, yeah, there's a few good questions there that would not be great for public discussion. But question, what do you think of Gideon so far compared to the other judges? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He didn't seem to be such a horn or sentence Yeah. That's a good point. He wasn't as skillful as the prophets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was the judge, right? She was the only female judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Deborah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because so far the judges have been like kind of the the only good people in the story? Like, okay, Israel is worshiping other gods, they're doing all sorts of things, and the judge is like the, the righteous person that God raises up. And yeah, they've been typically like warlords. Um, Ehud has some like secret assassin skills. Um, even Barak, even though he was kind of wimped out, he was, he was like a commander, like, you know, he led armies. Did you notice when I said they could be friends? Yeah. yeah, because they both did the same thing. They both had to have somebody come along. Yeah. yeah. Now, Barack asked, but and God asked Gideon. So there's a slight difference. Yeah. yeah. Which, and you said special people. This Peru guy, I don't know how, how to say yeah, that. Yeah, it's weird. But he mentioned him twice. Like, mm -hmm. he must have been some guy. Yeah. If, he, you know, I feel 
could let a priest help us. You know, yeah. 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 But yeah. there's, there's some lives. Yeah. Yeah, he's our first judge where the pristine image of the judge is kind of tarnished. Like, he kind of needs to be pushed just like all of the other people who are hiding and scared of the enemy. Um, so, in my mind, Gideon is the start of the decline of the judges, and that's why the book's going to start pointing out, like, there was no king in Israel in those days. Like, we just had the judges. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And, yeah, Gideon, even though you have this, int- this really nice, like, victory at the end here, he's definitely the, the start, the, the beginning of the end. He's the start of the moral slide of these judges and yeah he was threshing wheat like a little guy from a little tribe threshing wheat you know um, yes and we'll finish the story of Gideon next week because even though this was set up as a nice three act structure the rest of his life takes place and we'll talk about his sons and it continues the pattern a little bit so um, that's the first half of Gideon, and next week we'll, on Wednesday, remember Wednesday, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to remind each other on that, that'll be helpful all around. Um, yeah, hopefully the world is still here after Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, thank you, and why don't we close in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for these stories of people throughout Israel's history that even though it's so far so far gone, it seems like so long ago, they're still struggling with a lot of the same really deep internal problems that we have when things are difficult and when faith is tested and when we just kind of don't know what to do. So I thank you that we can still see and uh, see them from your view and from your eyes and for good and bad, what, what we need to do, how we need to follow you, and who you are and how, how patient you are and how you're quick to deliver your people as they cry out to you. So I thank you for the lessons that you've left for us and pray that we can take some really important things with us into our lives. Lord, please bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, thank you.